Good evening. My name is Michael Arroyo, and it's my privilege to serve Calvin University as its president. This evening's event, the awarding of the Kuiper Prize and lecture, this was supposed to occur as part of the Kuiper Conference in New York City in April, but it was rescheduled for New York City tonight due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, we finally decided we aren't giving up on uh, convening the lecture or the prize, uh, but we have deferred our time together in New York City for a future date. We did feel that it was really important to award the Kuiper Prize in the auspicious year of 2020 before 2020 was over. And if you can't be in New York, we wish you were all here at Calvin University and Calvin Theological Seminary campus, a place where curious learners are daily formed and equipped for work in God's world. Now I would like to inter introduce our uh, university pastor, Mary Holst, who will give uh, this gathering's invocation today. So thank you. Let's pray. Triune God, we praise you for your goodness. God, our Father, you created us to bear your image, to mimic your creativity, to think your thoughts after you, to enjoy and explore and steward your creation. Jesus, we know that we do not reflect your image perfectly. We fail all the time. Thank you for living a perfect life full of grace and truth so that we have hope. You are our redeemer. Holy Spirit, you empower us, you equip us, you challenge us so that we are continually being renewed, continually becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Thank you for your relentless love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, today we thank you for our friend David Brooke. We thank you that you gave him a curious mind and a love for words, but more than that, a heart that follows you. Thank you for his integrity, his discipline, his compassion, and his love for you and your world. We pray your blessing on him this evening and in the days to come, that he will continue to be a voice for truth, wisdom, and joy in a world that desperately needs it. We're thankful tonight, too, for Abraham Kuyper, for Ruth and Rimmer, for all the saints who have gone before. Thank you for all those in your world who build your kingdom. Thank you for this evening, and we offer it for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mary. T tonight's panelists, uh, I will introduce after the lecture, um, but I'm really grateful, first of all, and I want to recognize Ruth and Rimmer DeVries, who made this prize possible through their generous financial support. Rimmer's vision to extend the reach and support for a reformed approach to Christian cultural engagement that transcends national borders is put on display in powerful ways through the Kuiper Prize and Conference. And we are deeply grateful to Rimmer and to Ruth for their vision and support of both the conference as well as Calvin's new DeVries Institute for Global Faculty Development. I hope you'll stay tuned for more news and information in the future about this institute as it seeks to shape and serve a wider world. It is now my pleasure to say a few words about this year's recipient of the 2020 Abraham Kuyper Prize for Excellence in Reformed Faith and Public Life. When Rimmer DeVries first envisioned this prize, he hoped that it would be given to individuals whose life and work exemplified key concepts, practices, or teaching from the ideas of Abraham Kuyper. As Jordan Baller has noted in a recent article in Christianity Today, Kuyper is often introduced as a theologian, pastor, professor, journalist, or politician. He was all of these things, but Baller notes that at the heart of his work, he was a firm believer in the critical importance of civic and social institutions. Civic and social institutions are those voluntary associations like churches, Little League Baseball, Habitat for Humanity, Calvin University, or Calvin Theological Seminary. They occupy the social spaces distinct from realms like government and politics or business and the economy. And they have historically been a key source of vitality 
and social entrepreneurship in American public life. In the Dutch political context where Kuiper lived, political tensions between Catholics, Protestants, and secular groups were greatly diminished when the state allowed for each group to set up social and educational institutions of their own without fear of undue political pressure from those in authority. There may be important reminders and lessons from Kuiper's teaching and for 2020's award winner that we'll learn here tonight. We give this award tonight to journalist and public intellectual David Brooks. The award committee has selected Mr. Brooks because of his significant intellectual and journalistic contributions to civil society and culture in American life. In our theological tradition, we believe in saving grace, that Jesus promises salvation and common grace, God's expression of grace to all humanity and the creation itself. The award committee discerned that in Brooks, we see an intellectual, an intellectual and social architecture for today's postmodern world, an architecture that requires social trust as its cornerstone. This is a social architecture that would have been familiar to Kuiper for it enables important civic and cultural institutions that provide us with the mutual accountability and social restraint that all that allow followers of Jesus to bear witness to the gospel in a world hungry for good news. It was almost a year ago that I informed this prize's benefactor, Rimmer DeVries, that David Brooks was to receive this award. Rimmer was delighted. Rimmer then fulfilled his baptism this past January, and we remember him in this award tonight. In my work with him over the years, he had many strong opinions that he expressed, and not all of them were favorable, but you can rest assured, David, that he had a very high opinion of you. Please join me in honoring the 2020 Abraham Kuyper Prize recipient, Mr. David Brooks. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be virtually at Calvin. I've been at Calvin uh, in person uh, and enjoyed lovely time there. It has to be said there are other schools in the area that have been a little more generous in the swag department, but I feel confident that Calvin can, uh, can make up for that deficiency. Uh, it's also a pleasure uh, to get this prize. It's a pleasure and an honor of great respect to so many people who came before who are my teachers and some of my friends. Uh, and it's a, an honor to be associated in any way with Abraham Kuyper. He's known for many things. Uh, obviously, the most famous thing that we all know of him is the statement that there's not square, not a square in the whole domain of human existence, which Christ does not cry mine, which is a saying a lot of my politician friends believe in. And he was also a Christian who was active in political life. And he invites us to think about the relationship between the secular world and the spiritual world. And he was active in the creation of culture and understood that culture creation is, is at the center of our social lives. I thought I'd mention and build my talk around one of his concepts that he's also extremely famous for, uh, and that is the, the separation of spheres. Now, Rich Mao, who's involved in this event, wrote a book, a, sh a good short book about Kuiper and mentioned that one of his students, apparently not having done the reading, thought the phrase was the separation of spheres. He thought it was a military doctrine and wrote a final paper on this subject. Uh, but it is the separation of spheres. It's a very Dutch concept, as Mao points out. Holland is under perpetual threat of flood, and they have to divide everything up and build boundaries and build fences very neatly. And Kuiper wants us to build fences, but build fences in our society. And so the separation of spheres is the idea that different realms of life have different methods and purposes and should be kept apart. Family life, business, art, politics, the university, and the church. Kuiper wrote, each sphere has its own identity, its own unique task, its own God-given prerogatives. On each God has conferred its own peculiar right of existence and reason for existence. In Kuiper's day, a lot of the separation that he was concerned with concerned church and state, and whether the church should be involved in the state and whether the state, how the state should be separate from the church, and he wanted some boundaries established. In our day, when I think of separation of spheres, I think of a different kind of separation and a different kind of encroachment. And that is the encroachment of politics on all aspects of our lives, a process that has been happening pretty much my whole adult life. When I was in college two or three decades ago, politics had not yet swallowed up everything else. 
When I was in college, I did not read for four years a newspaper. I don't think I knew anybody who read a newspaper. Political life was happening, but it just wasn't, seemed very germane to our lives, and we were reasonably engaged students. I later was hired by William F. Buckley to work at National Review, and Buckley made a clear distinction between being a conservative and being a Republican. Conservative was something we were at National Review. Republican was entirely different. We were very divorced from politics. Every Monday night, Buckley would invite us over to his house for dinner, and the people at the dinner would be people like Anatole Broyard, who was a literary critic, writers from The New Yorker. Our conversations were almost never political. They were li about literature, about culture, about history, about people. But politics had not yet subsumed, even for those of us who worked at political magazines. One of my heroes was Irving Kristol, the godfather of neoconservatism. He, he lived in New York, he worked in New York. And as he mentioned years later, I didn't know any politicians except Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was primarily an intellectual. It was not a world that a lot of people who were writing about politics felt compelled to get into because politicians were in a different realm and writers and people of ideas were primarily in the realm of ideas and culture. And that seemed a little more separate than, from politics than it does today. And so we had cultural events, a Saul Bellow novel, a John Updike novel. We had television shows, talk shows, which were almost entirely about culture, the Dick Cavett show. We lived in the shadow of, of Martin Buber and Richard John, New, or Richard John Newhouse and, and Reinhold Niebuhr. And these people spoke about great events. Niebuhr could be on the cover of Time magazine because ideas were seen to be the historical drivers. When I learned of history at the University of Chicago, I learned that Nietzsche came along and things would never be the same. Before that, Darwin came along. Not before that, after that, after that. But these big ideas was the idea that ideas drove history. And politics seemed small. Ike and Nixon had their differences, but Ike and Nixon were not really shaping the culture. They were not from two different moral universes. That all began to change probably a little before I got to college with the rise of feminism and the rise of the sense that the personal is political that how you live your life, from how many children you have to whether you marry or divorce, are political acts. And politics began very slowly, I think, to invade all parts of life so that everything became political. My newspaper, The New York Times, recently did a, sur a study of the, um, the 25 most important pieces of art in the last 25 years. None of them aspire to beauty. Almost all of them were political. For example, some of you may know the artist Jenny Holzer. She, she was, did a, just a thing, a word, which is just words, abuse of power comes as no surprise. And so when your art community, which is in charge of educating the emotions, which is in charge of lifting up the human spirit, which is in charge of inspiring us to understand and perceive the world in different ways, becomes simply a political arena then politics has encroached reasonably far into life, and certain other aspects of life have been uh, diminished. Then I would say the universities, politics came to encroach those, and especially the humanities. The humanities, which used to be about studying George Eliot and the, the nature of her characters, the nature of those stories, suddenly became often a deconstruction of race, class, and gender, getting involved much more in political action uh, and less humanistic study across a range of disciplines, the, the basic mental schema was that history is a possession of oppressor and oppressed groups. That, of course, is true, but it is not the whole truth. But it became to seem that way. Then politics embraced and really took over public, the public life of the Christian church. As my wife says, the word evangelical went from being an adjective to being a noun, went from being a way of practicing the faith to a tribal community in which your voting patterns were clearly part of your central identity, if not the central part of your identity. And so politics leapt forward. Now, why did politics encroach on culture? Why did politics take over? In my view, we went from a world that assumed a basic trust, assumed a basic security, to a society which did not assume a basic trust, did not assume a basic security. And so life seemed more precarious, life seemed more dangerous and the political battle seemed more apocalyptic. And so people began to clump together for safety. And those clumps became parties and those parties became tribes. And so we had entered a world of the culture war which turned into the political war. Even when I was a young adult, 
Nobody talked about Red and Blue America as separate entities. Nobody would object if your son or daughter married the, a person from opposing parties. But now we do. Now we're in a different world. Now we're in a world which your political identity is one of the most salient things about you. Now we're in a world in which Donald Trump can win the presidency purely as a cultural figure. Donald Trump is not about policies or was not about policies. He's not about programs. He was about a creation of a certain sort of masculinity, a certain sort of of projection of faith. He was a projection of certain cultural symbols, and he took advantage of these cultural symbols to wage a purely cultural campaign and then a cultural pre uh, presidency. And so this is a world in which politics has not only invaded culture, it's really taken over. Now magazines, the greatest magazines in the country like The New Yorker and The Atlantic carry mostly political comment. First 10 years on my column from 2003 to 2013, I wrote half my columns about politics and about half about culture. Now I have to write all about politics because that is the only thing readers will want to read. That is the only thing my editors will want to link to. As Richard Mao wrote, people look at each other in new ways with suspicion and a propensity toward conflict. So what have we lost in this? The core problem and the core thing we've lost is epistemological in how we know reality. There's an epistemology inherent in the political worldview. First, it tends to see people in groups as collection of tribes. It's not good at seeing persons, the full personhood. The person using the political lens also tends to see the essential relationship between groups as power struggles. It's about power and the manipulation of power. Third, the person using the political lens tends to see an agonistic world, a competitive world. Competition is the essential fact of life. Finally, politics, when it consumes everything, tends to produce an ap apocalyptic worldview. It imagines the stakes are always ex existential. It imagines that it, there will be complete horrors if the other side happens to win. It has to imagine this because this is how it gives life meaning. In the political worldview, political conquest is a cause that gives people their life's meaning. And it produces two mindsets. The first, which we're most familiar with, is the people who can only see from one point of view, who only know their partisan viewpoint. Knowing, as Alan Jacobs says, is not for understanding, knowing is for belonging. And they know whatever is, will be helpful for them to belong to their tribe. The second, which we often don't focus on, but is just as destructive, is an objective way of view. This is the way that pollsters view, political consultants view. This is a way in which the intellect is used for seeing the world from afar not having a personal knowledge, but only knowing the data about a person. This is the kind of knowledge you use when you want to manipulate people. This is knowledge for manipulation from afar. The knower is separated from the known. Now the problem when we live with this sort of epistemology is not only we're a bitterly divided society, that's obvious. The problem is we end up in a world where no one is seen. The humanistic, the religious way of seeing is a seeing of person, seeing of each individual person to the depth of their moral character, to the depth of their soul. The political way of seeing is only seeing the surface of a person, only seeing the person as a part of a group. And I would say as part of my coverage in the last four or five years, the thing I see constantly is people feeling unseen. Blacks feeling their daily life is not seen by whites. Republicans and Democrats looking at each other with blind incomprehension kids in the basement, teenagers feeling that no one knows them, husbands and wives in broken marriages realizing that the person who should know them best actually has no clue. We just have an epidemic of misseeing in this country. And I think it's partly the way we look at each other has changed. And so I've come to believe that the chief skill of any successful organization, school, family, or nation is the ability to see others deeply and be deeply seen. And that is something that politics makes harder. Now, there are causes for hope. I speak to you after an election, which has had more or less a divided result. But still, there are causes for hope. I remember once going to a, a Trump rally. This was in the beginning of his rise. And I met a woman there who was a, a lesbian biker who read Kierkegaard and converted to Sufi Islam after surviving a plane crash and was now supporting Trump. And I remember thinking, what category does this woman come from? Because <laughs> she defied all categories. And when you actually go to rallies and you actually talk to people about their lives, 
you feel that you find that nobody actually falls into the neat stereotypes that we have in our partisan mindsets. And I think the election results of this campaign reminded us all of that. It's not that Biden won or Trump won. I happen to think Biden won. But it's that Trump got a higher share of the non-white vote than any Republican in the last 60 years. If you went by the stereotypes, you could not have predicted that. Trump doubled his support among LGBTQ. If you went by the stereotypes, you would not have predicted that. We got to see how complicated people are. We got to see how complicated the nation is. We got to see how many narratives are going on in this time. And if you just see through the political lens, you don't see those other narratives. Now, if you're trying to see people deeply, faith really comes in handy. In Christianity, knowledge is personal. God came down in the form of a person. You seek to know that person. You can't know God through objective detachment. You can't know God the way you would know a table. God is not known through this sort of objective reasoning. God is not known at arm's length. God cannot be reduced to labels. God cannot be captured by words. In knowing God, one basic posture is not cold reasons. One basic posture is reverence, affection, and awe. And so it's a much more emotional form of knowing. Faith is the opposite to the political ways of knowing. In politics, you feel unseen, but in faith, one person is known. That is the essence of faith, to be known. Psalm 139 makes this clear. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. The posture of faith is that God sees through all your clean services, surfaces to your messy bits and still loves you. This is a God of knowing love. And so faith is not only a way of being known, it is also a way of knowing. St. Augustine wrote, When I awoke in you, I saw very differently, infinite, in a very different sense. But what I saw was not seen with the eye of the body. Augustine is talking about seeing with the eye of the soul. Not seeing people as, per, as, as just as groups, but as persons. And you're seeing the world in subjectivity as a subjective thing. You're seeing each person as subjective. You're seeing in a vulnerable way, a way that doesn't often distinction, distinguish between what we think of as knowing, as reason, and an emotion. In the Bible, the word know can mean anything from I study something to I have sex with. The word know does not obey, abide by our distinction of reason and emotion. It's an effect of knowing, it's a knowing love. And the two go together. And it's a vulnerable love. In order to behold, you have to be willing to be beheld. The weird thing about this way of knowing is that it is ancient and it is emotional and is what the scientists would say, affective. But it's also in accord with what we're learning about the human person through neuroscience, through the cognitive sciences. We're learning how subjective each individual person is. When you go out and look at the world, it feels like you're like watching a TV. The world is coming at you, it's sending bombardments and you receive it and you record it on your screen. But if you actually saw that way, you would be overwhelmed with data. Nobody sees that way. When you look out on the world, what you're really, your mind is really doing is sending up predictive models of what it thinks it sees and then sending back confirming, yes, the prediction is correct or the prediction is incorrect. So you're not seeing the world passively. You're casting out nets. The pattern of perception is not observation and response. The basic pattern of perception is prediction and correction. And the sense of sending out maps, sending out predictions, extremely subjective process from one person to another. While you're doing that, your body and your guts and your viscera are reacting to the situation in all sorts of ways, heart rate going up, adrenal glands pumping, your guts either being pacified or, or enervated. And this process is then read by the brain through the vagus nerve in a process called interoception. And the brain is assigning an emotional state to the state of the body. This process too is extremely subjective. It's not something that happens in groups. We used to think there are universal emotions. It seems there are no universal emotions. We're making them up. We're making them up importantly through our culture. Your body feels something. Your brain reads what it feels and it gives it a concept, sadness, anxiety, anger. 
We in English language have one word for anger. In German, they have three words, three different words for different kinds of anger. In Mandarin, they have five different words for different kinds of anger. Some cultures have emotions that we don't have. The Czechs have litos, which is roughly torment over misery combined with a desire for revenge. The Spanish apparently have peña ajena, which is embarrassment on somebody else's behalf. The Japanese have something called arigata mawaku, which arises when somebody does you a favor you didn't want them to do for you, but you have to thank them for it anyway. And so if you don't have these emotional concepts, you can't have these emotions. It comes to us through our ancestors, through our culture, and it's an extremely subjective process. And so when you're seeing someone, politics does not see the subjectivity of each person, but faith and the humanities see the subjectivity of each person. You can't know a person well till they know how they process reality. And it's that manufacture of reality that is the subjective process, is the core of a person. And in this process, variation is the norm. There are seven billion of us on Earth, so there are seven billion ways of being. There's actually infinitely more than that because each of our way of being changes moment by moment. They say you can never step in the same river twice. You can never meet the same person twice because we are always changing. And this brings us back to Kuiper. The final concept that we learned from him was what he called pluriformity. This is the idea that God loves manyness. There are many different kinds of beetle. Why do there have to be so many? God seems to love manyness. There are many different forms of people. There are many different persons within each person. And the key to life is seeing the manyness at the same time as you see the wholeness. To seeing what separates everybody, but to see what binds them together. Now we all struggle with that. Each person has multiple identities. Politics tends to reduce it to one identity. Each nation has multiple narratives. Politics tends to reduce it to one narrative or another. Progressives tell a diversity narrative. Conservatives tell a threat narrative. But the big need, na need now is to reduce the role the politics plays, open up space for different spheres with different epistemologies. We're finishing a hyper-political era, which has been hyper-destructive to the American society and to each of us. And as I've, I hope I've tried to communicate to our souls and to the way we see each other, to our relationships. Now, as Parker Palmer says, every epistemology implies an ethic. Every way of knowing implies a way of being in the world. A person with multiple epistemologies can play different notes on the neural piano, can bring them into unity. Objective knowledge and enlightenment knowledge is often oppositional, separating the knower from the known. But the kind of epistemology I find here, and I think we get from Kuiper, is illumination, what Augustine called illumination, illumination into unity. It's based on the understanding you can only know someone if you know how they see you. You can only know someone if you don't only see them, but you see out from them and to see how they see the world. And this kind of attention, this kind of illumination is a moral act, it's naming somebody and creating somebody into being. And it's a way of knowing that's ultimately unitive, that takes what is dispersed, two bodies separated by skulls, and makes them unified as one joint mind combined by loops of spiritual and intellectual ideas. And that's what I take from Kuiper. And that's why I end this election season, which has been an exhausting season, ultimately on a hopeful note, because we've gotten sick of politics. I do, do it for a living, and I'm less political than almost anybody I know. But we can see that there are other ways of knowing, other secular ways of knowing, spiritual ways of knowing, and they lead to better ways of living. Thanks so very much. Thank you on behalf of Calvin University and Calvin Theological Seminary for that great address. And uh, it's wonderful to have you here with us. We're so grateful that you can engage in a live conversation. And for those that are watching us on Facebook Live, you can uh, put your questions in the in the chat spot. We can't guarantee we'll get to all of them, but uh, feel free to do so and we'll pick those up. And to uh, con to uh, sort of have a conversation here on campus uh, tonight. Um, I want to introduce a couple of people to you that are really special here in the Calvin community. The first is Jordan Ballard. Jordan is the coordinator of the Kuiper Conference and a great Kuiper scholar himself, um, and also the author of the Christianity Today article that I was just referring to. Um, Jordan, it's it's great to have you here. and. Um, and we know that uh, Jordan's been very involved in adapting 
of the uh, conference and its proceedings to the realities of COVID. And so, um, so if you feel free in a moment, if you want to say a few words about that uh, or um, kind of what people can look forward to who might be following for that reason, that would be great. And then the second person I want to introduce to you is Jewel Maidenblick. Jewel is a colleague of mine in work and ministry and service. He is the president of, of Calvin Theological Seminary, a very, very good leader and scholar here in our community, uh, a pastor and a lawyer. And so he has a lot of spheres going, pastor, lawyer, educator, um, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation that you might engage. So I know you've got a few questions that you've prepared for and a conversation that, that you were eager to have. And um, I, Jewel, why don't you start things off and I will step back here and, um, and um, enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for your partnership always in terms of Kelvin, University of Kelvin Seminary. I know that when we heard David Brooks say that, you know, he gets different swag at another school that, that we'll make sure that we get something to you at some point uh, so that you have it. Uh, and so make sure, David, that you follow up and make because we do want to keep our commitments to you and to others. So just grateful once again. I found again that in 21 minutes you gave such nuggets of wisdom, but also things that we want to mine out a little bit more together. And so certainly as I and others have the opportunity to do that, um, I saw a question though in the chat, and I actually want to start there so that we kind of build a context. The question was, um, thank you so much, someone said about, but they asked specifically, when did you, when did you get introduced to Abraham Kuyper's writings? You mentioned Rich Mao, but maybe just a little bit about your own kind of background related to Abraham Kuyper, and then I'm going to dive into some of the other questions that we have. Yeah, I guess it was probably seven to 10 years ago. I sort of got into this world seven to 10 years ago. I was on a, a faith journey. And when you're on a faith journey, one of the things people do is they give you books. And so when I was just exploring faith, um, I got probably 500 books from different friends, only 350 of which were uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Uh, but I, I got um, uh, a bunch of Kuiper books. Uh, books about him primarily, and I just heard the phrase Kuyperian, and you hear that phrase a lot, and for a long time, I just sort of nodded along sagely, uh, really not having any clue who it was. I have a friend named Adam Kuyper. I thought he might have a, a father somewhere, um, but then what intrigued me was, um, I'm like you, I guess, pastor and lawyer, I'm really intrigued by people who have dual professions, and dual, dual ways of looking at the world. When I was in college, I did a whole series of newspaper articles in the school paper about people who were professors, but also something else in downtown Chicago. I just think it's so important to have two ways of looking at the world, one which is more theoretical and or theological, and one which is really nitty gritty. And when I learned that about him, I had to, I had to learn Mao and, and learn more. And um, fortunately, uh, my friend Rich Mao uh, wrote a very short and extremely accessible book, and that was my way in. Well, as, thank you for sharing, and I actually have a copy of that book right here, and, 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 and I might refer to just a few moments, but when I think about the nuggets that I heard, one of those that you said it's key for individuals, and I would say also as you did institutions, to see others deeply and be deeply seen. And I thought about actually a phrase that Abraham Kuyper gave to those who once again supported him, prayed for him, encouraged him. He called them the little people. And it was not a term of uh, derogatory term at all. It was an expression really made in, making sure that he knew as a political leader and also as a pastor that to keep that little flock together, and it certainly referenced his own faith journey where a, a pious woman actually challenged his scholasticism to be a deeper faith. So it ties to that. But when you think of that, and I would say diagnosis, that we don't see each other deeply, and we're then not deeply being seen by others. There's a loss there. There's a, as you said, there's a, a division that begins to erupt in that way. And could you just spend a little bit more about what it means to see others more deeply? What is some of the individual, but maybe some of the institutional ways that you have heard about or would actually testify to? Yeah, well, you know, occasionally you do feel deeply seen. And when you do, I think one of the things um, that strikes you is that it's not an act of rational, detached observation. It's an act of projective love. And so I'm going to about to drop a name, but I've been interviewed um, twice in my life by Oprah. 
And she is someone who just beams a level of affection at you that you feel enveloped in her charisma and her, her warmth. And she has a, a, just a way of making you feel known. And it's not a rational thing. It's an emotional projection. And I will say after the second time, she interviewed me four years apart for different books. And after the second time, after the cameras were off, she said, I've, I've never seen you, seen a person so changed. You were so blocked before. Uh, and I felt actually quite known and actually proud of that moment that, that in, even in middle age, one can make oneself more legible. But so much, so, there's so much distrust in our society. Uh, and when you're distrustful and you're scared, the problem with being distrustful is you isolate yourself further. And the thing you need most is the thing you rob yourself of. And so I saw a study today that 48% of Americans say, no one knows me well. Imagine going through life where you feel no one really gets me. Just a horrible way to go through life. And it's partly because people around you aren't taking the time to broadcast that affection upon you. But partly maybe you're not making yourself legible. Uh, and, and I would say in, in public speaking and the one we all are in front of the classroom, uh, to be effective, you have to throw yourself on the audience and let them catch you. They will catch you. Uh, and so it's that leap of, of faith in each other and trust is, is like faith in God, except for faith in other people. And so you have to make that leap of faith, uh, being seen, you have to be behold, you have to be willing to be beheld. And that's a choice we all get to make or not make. It reminds me of when you said that about key phrases that we talk about, even in leadership in a different setting, vulnerability, transparency, authenticity, but certainly this expression of love. So from actually that book of Richard Mao is a quote from Joseph Piper that, Piper that where there is love, there is seeing. So hmm. as we think about the fact that we don't love and you reference that we don't really see another person. Uh, when we think about the the clarification of maybe a prescription for that. Uh, we live once again in a very divided world. So what has helped you see others and hear other stories? I think it's being around people who um, live their lives as a gift. Uh, I have a friend, Parcho Aguilas, who lives in Houston, and he, um, he works at an organization that takes uh, mostly Latino men who've broken their backs in um, construction accidents and are paralyzed. And he gives them um, wheelchairs and catheters and diapers, the things they need to lead dignified lives. And then he trains them to become social workers. So you'll be in a neighborhood in Houston and, uh, and uh, 50 Latino guys in wheelchairs will roll into your neighborhood to do social work. And when Pancho speaks, he speaks with just, all I can say it's a holiness. And I once said to him, Pancho, you radiate holiness. And he said, no, I reflect holiness. And when you're with somebody, around somebody that deeply good, of course, it inspires you to want to be more like it. It's a contagion. And so I would say it's the experience of being around people who, you mentioned the phrase, the little people. I mean, Jesus was right to go to the margins. Because it's on those margins that the, the examples are set. And I would say in the last couple of years, I've worked for an organization called Weave. I've spent a lot of time with people on the, like Poncho. And I would say they, they have an inspiring and transformative effect because they rub off on you. And I think about your writings like The Road to Character that speak also about getting into those places for yourself and for others for that. Uh, I want to go to another uh, point and then actually, Jordan, I'm going to make sure that you get your voice in this conversation. So after that, uh, you talked about the fact that we need to reduce the political sphere. You started off with how large that political sphere has gotten and how it then overwhelms us. And you spoke about your own journey. And I, I think you might have heard a few amens and amens and amens of encouragement to you that that was uh, a great critique and analysis of our times. And yet the reality is we still live in these times. And you did reference some levels of hope that you have. But when I think about reducing political spheres, it's also the strengthening of other spheres. It's to recognize the place of family and church and business to the, actually have their own spheres. As you think about that dynamic, uh, what do you see that might be helpful for us to think through in terms of reducing the political sphere, but also strengthening other spheres? Well, first, um, you know, my business has not helped. For some reason, reason the news business and the newspaper business has gotten in the position where we spend 90% of our time covering the 10% of life that's covered by politics 
and 10% of our time covering the 90% of life that really matters. When you think about what matters in your life, and I'm a political journalist, so I'm, I'm deep into politics. What matters is your faith, your relationship to God, your relationship to other people, the state of your soul, your friends, your hobbies, the musicians and artists who give you joy. Uh, but somehow we've, we've become addicted to politics and people in my profession, we respond to incentives like anybody else. And we p follow page views. If I write 9 million articles bashing one party or another and you read all of them, then I'm going to keep doing it because that's what my profession rewards. And so somehow I think it's up to us as readers to find the other things and to find other subjects to talk about. It used to be that people debated sermons. Uh, my wife runs an or a platform called Breaking Ground and a magazine called Comment, and they're broadcasting great sermons, which, and we can all just listen to that and have arguments and discussions about them. It used to be when a novelist like Saul Bellow released a book, it was a major cultural event. And I think that was because we understood that the key element of life is how we emotionally react to it. Politics is for the emotionally avoidant, who don't wanna talk about emotion. But art and literature and theology and prayer, frankly, is about educating the emotions. It's about having different words, concepts for anxiety, distrust, about knowing which loves are higher than other loves. And we've become a, an emotionally and morally inarticulate culture because we've spent so much time on politics. So I, I think it's focused, and I'll, I will tell you, as someone who I wrote that book, The Road to Character, about moral uplift, I wrote a book called The Second Mountain, about spiritual awakening. And I would sometimes get invited to talk at conferences with CEOs and CFOs, and they spent the four last days in some boring convention center talking about healthcare plans. And then I think, okay, I'm gonna go in and talk to them about St. Augustine or Dorothy Day. And I would look at these guys in their, all their boring suits, and I would think, this is not gonna go well. But then I would start talking, and I could hear a quality of silence that was unlike what I normally hear when I talk about other stuff because there was such a hunger for spiritual talk, especially for those who are secular. And when I think of, say, about the Christian colleges and universities, sometimes these schools feel besieged, like the world's coming at their door, coming at them. But I always say, you have what the world needs. You have the world, what the world desperately wants, which is a moral vocabulary to talk about the good life. And be confident in that, and let's try to spread that conversation. Thank you, David. Uh, Jordan, thank you for what you've done for this conference, what you do in making us connect with others. Thanks for all you wrote on Christianity Today and uh, once again, emphasize for people looking at uh, What are some of the questions that come to mind from your heart? Well, David, as I was listening to your talk, I kept this phrase kept recurring to me. It's a kind of a, an adage or a canon from uh, conservatism classically understood that politics is downstream from culture. And um, you know, I, I, the image kept coming back to mind of of this flood that's overridden the banks of of this river, and and so I wondered if you could if you could reflect a little bit on that 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 adage. Um, is it true? To what extent is it true? Ought it to be true if it's not true now? And what about our culture has changed that, uh, for example, we are seem to be demanding from from our journalists so much uh, attention to politics as opposed to other things where we we ought to be valuing things. Yeah. As you were speaking, I was reminded of a, of a saying from Daniel Patrick Moynihan that the central conservative truth is that culture matters most, and the central liberal truth is that politics can affect culture. And that's in a healthy society. I think those both those things are true. I would say our problem is that poli politics has swallowed culture. Politics is now culture. And so when you think of the last presidential campaign, it's often, and you think about the way our politics are divided, it's urban-rural. It's how do you feel about pickup trucks? How do you feel about guns? How do you feel how do you feel about a certain projection of masculinity? Donald Trump was not a policy figure. He was a cultural figure. And so and to me and then what follows from that is that people derive their identity from politics. Uh, and when politics becomes your identity, how you define yourself, then that's asking of politics more than can it, than it can deliver. Because politics is a thin realm. It's about, it should be about making some compromise on the earned income tax credit. It should be a, a way, you know, it should be a wonky thing. And there's one of my heroes is a, a British journalist named Walter Badgett, 
who said that government should be dull. The best government is a little dull. It just administers things so we can think about other higher affairs. And so to me, it's a matter of scaling, but just having our culture fights, and we're gonna have culture fights in this country, but they shouldn't be waged through the presidency and they shouldn't be waged through an office that has nuclear power and weapons and is really about at some level about coercion. That's just a poisonous com- com- conversation. You, you've got a, a, a really fine piece in the Atlantic that talks about America's moral convulsion and the decline of social trust. And so I wonder if you would talk a little bit about what some of the social institutions are wherein social trust could be rebuilt. Are there shared institutions that we still have nowadays in such a polarized culture where um, everything seems to be dividing us, whether it's uh, social media or um, all kinds of other, you know, obviously the mainstream media that you talked about a little bit. Um, all of these institutions seem to be increasingly polarized and divided. So where are there shared institutions yet that we can we can encounter the other and come into these and, and do the shared kind of work of living together? Yeah, I think in civil society, there still are numbers of shared institutions. There still are, we have loves in common. We love our place. I was in Wilkes, North Carolina before COVID, and there's a, that was a place where they founded Holly Farms and the NASCAR and Lowe's Hardware, and they lost all their jobs. All those headquarters moved. And so this was a town that was devastated, went through its opiate addiction in the 1990s, and met with people from that town, and they were from all over the political map, all over the racial, every race, but they have a common love. They love their town. Uh, They love their kids. You can always unite people around children. And so there are, I think there are technologies for convening. And even online, some of the Facebook groups, uh, you know, you love your, your Corgi dog or your Mazda. And so you get in a conversation about Mazdas. And then it turns out somebody's a Trump supporter, somebody's a Biden supporter, somebody's a communist, but at least you all love Mazdas. And so I do think there are some realms. And at the very end of that piece, I talk about how societies can rebuild trust. And it happens in three steps. The first is cultural. In the 1890s, when we turned around, social gospel movement replaced social Darwinism. So you had a more communal culture, religious revival. Then civic institutions, the 1890s, You have the creation of the Boys and Girls Scouts, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Settlement House Movement, the Temperance Movement, all these movements arose. And then finally, around 1900, you had the Progressive Movement. So when religious, cultural, civic, and then political. And that seems to me a very probable way our society is going to turn itself around. Well, David, thanks so much for joining us. you know, I did have the opportunity to, to to do some planning around some events, and you were you were going to be gracious enough to join us in New York when we were all going to be there in person. Um, this is a substitute, but it's a, a welcome one that we're still able to do this through some of those technologies that can bring us together across times and space and places. Um, so thank you for that, and and Jewel, I'm happy to throw it on back to you if you've got some final questions, maybe from the audience or. If I could just say, I'm happy. Um, next time you actually have the conference, I'd love to attend and. Okay. Um, learn a little more about Kuiper. Thanks. We can make that happen. You've actually, that's a wonderful gesture on your part and a, a way of once again seeing and hearing other voices. That's why I found at the Kuiper conference. Uh, it's really um, been beneficial to see that wider world. Uh, you touched on it briefly, I think, in terms of just your answer to Jordan, but maybe to give you a chance because near the end of your your talk that others have seen, uh, they might not have read, and I do recommend, again, that Atlantic article. You talked about pluriformity of institutions. And in some ways, um, that allowing and that flowering, that benefiting, that growing. But uh, he certainly, Kuiper, believed in that. But as you think about other mediating institutions, so maybe, as you said, they need to be there. What are ways in which we can provide buffers uh, to allow that to, those institutions to grow? Is there a need, once again, for us to recognize that there is this mediating institutions that help us find and see each other in different ways? Yeah, well, the, you know, in the 1920s and 1930s and 1950s, we had uh, the Rotarians, the Community Chest, the uh, other Kiwanis Club, and at one point, a third of American men were in one of those national chapter-based organizations. We're not going back to that. But we do have a rise in us, what Dorothy Day called the slow upheaval of people getting more active in their community. I 
knew a woman through my the Weave Project named Aisha Butler. She lives in Englewood in Chicago, tough neighborhood. She was going to move out, but she on the day she was moving out, um, she looked across the way and saw a little girl in a pink dress playing with broken bottles in an empty lot. And she turns to her husband and says, we're not leaving. We're not just going to be another family that left that. And so she Googles volunteer in Englewood and she gets a little, a little active. And now she runs Rage, which is the big community organization in Englewood. And they clean up empty lots. They help people get informed about how to vote. They help the unfortunate. And now when you go to Englewood in the stores, they have t-shirts that say proud daughter of Englewood, proud son of Englewood. And so these are people who are just rising up. And many of them are very informal. Some of them form organizations, some of them don't. There was a woman we met in Florida. She helped the kids across the street uh, after elementary school, just to guide them across the street. And we asked her, do you have, um, do you get paid for this? And she said, no. And we said, do you volunteer in your community? And she said, no. And she says, well, you, aren't you volunteering now? And she said, no. And what are you doing next? And she said, well, on Thursdays, I take food to the hospital. And we said, do you have any time to volunteer? And she said, no. She didn't consider that volunteering. It was just part of being a neighbor. And if you can shift the norms around that kind of micro level, I've come to have great faith in, in micro, and as it says in the Bible, and the sparks fly upward. And so I think those people are all around, and certainly in your region of Michigan, it, it, there's no place uh, with more, denser connections and denser uh, elements of social capital. This is, your, your region is held up as the model. Um, and we've just got to kind of spread that around um, different parts of the country. Well, thanks for what you said about West Michigan. Although for us who live here, we're still searching. We need uh, some of those same things that you've been talking about, most definitely. Uh, one of the questions that came in from the chat was uh, understanding the role of politics. So we've talked about diminishing of the political sphere, but here's a question about um, recognizing its value. Uh, what is the idea that politics is not all of life, culture is asserted, but those who are marginalized will often respond that it is life for them. It is their hope. Uh, I can think of, once again, say 1965 and some of the Voting Rights Act. So there's this march for those moments. And certainly as a lawyer background and you have connections in that world as well, you know that, that, that people do look for what politics or government, and maybe a better way of putting it, what government can do. How do you respond to that? Um, assertion. Yeah, well, there's a reason I spend 60% of my life uh, working, at least working life on politics, because it is it is important. I, it's a matter of balance. Obviously, I believe in caring about politics. I don't think politics and government can provide care and relationship. And the care and relationship happens horizontally and vertically, best outside the political realm. But what the, polit the politics can do and what democracy does is it recognizes your dignity. Democracy is based on the idea of universal human dignity and that every voice deserves to live in a, be heard and, and to live in some form of material dignity, civic dignity, and in, in the realm of justice. And I have a friend who says, if you don't care about politics, first, that's a luxury because a lot of people who live in a, a world of corruption, live in a world of want, live in a world where they may get shot in the back of the head because it's such a violent, place, those people don't have the luxury of not caring about politics. The second thing I would say is if you don't care about politics, politics will eventually care about you. So it's a matter of finding, of putting things, as Kuiper said, in their spheres. Uh, in the realm of relationship, in the realm of care, I wouldn't go to government for that. In the realm of dignity, in the realm of some sort of more equality in our country, uh, in the realm of justice, then I would go to government for that. And so it's, it's just a question of spheres. I'm reminded as I speak of uh, Plato said, when you want to educate somebody, he called it the ladder of beauty. Uh, show them a beautiful face. Uh, and when they see a beautiful face, they'll realize there's a better kind of beauty, which is a beautiful personality. And if they see a beautiful personality, they'll realize there's a better kind of beauty, which is truth, investigating, finding truth. And then if they see that kind of beauty, they'll realize there's a better kind of beauty, which is justice is the realm of politics and if they see that they'll see an even better kind of beauty he, uh, he said from which nothing can be taken and nothing can be added the transcendent unified beauty of god and so that's another version of different spheres and so everything in its place as, as kuiper would say in dutch with much longer words 
All right, we're coming down to the uh, end, and I have uh, two more questions to ask. Uh, and I'm going to start with this question. Uh, you mentioned in many ways about the political sphere, but also faith in its many different and once again, varieties of expression. What is your message for faith communities uh, that would encourage them, challenge them about what it means to live in this culture today? And I say that as a person who, once again, as you look at, uh, you know, and I'll put this up here, it's nearby my desk. Uh, so we've had the politicizations of masks, and I'm not asking to answer that question and specifically, but how does how do faith communities? What would you say is the muscle we need to reengage ourselves well where we should be, but also recognize these other spheres that you've mentioned tonight? Yeah, I'd say the first thing is uh, be not afraid. <laughs> Uh, don't feel besieged or show, even if you may feel the culture is hostile to you in some ways, uh, walk with confidence in your faith and enjoy it. You know, as someone who came to faith later in life, as, as C.S. Lewis said, the best argument for Christianity is Christians. And what I saw was a unique form of goodness, both in a deep way, like Dorothy Day way, but even in the everyday way of friends who just radiated joy. And that's a very compelling um thing to see and to encounter a level of beauty, uh, personal beauty in, in, in that. Uh, and then, you know, I always say that there were ramps when I came to faith, there were ramps and walls. The ramps were Christians who, who radiated joy and who, who um, just spoke in a spiritually informed way and introduced me to language to express what was inexpressible. Uh, the, the walls were things like invasive care, where people would say, oh, God, put it on my heart to totally invade your privacy right now. And I was like, no, I don't really need that. Another wall was, was, um, was teams. What team are you going to join? Uh, another wall was a combination of a spiritual superiority complex combined with an intellectual inferiority complex. And this is not a problem at Calvin, but sometimes I would think, we're not gonna be super tough minded because we just wanna be affirming of each other all the time. And Mark Knowles, the scandal of the evangelical mind is still sort of a real thing. And so it's like any institution, imperfect institution, but the core message is, is just a joyful, powerful message and people should have trust in it and not feel besieged. Thanks for that call to courage, love and joy. My last question really is to recognize that we are uh, coming to you from a campus and there are students that uh, will either be listening in now or they're going to listen in later and certainly professors and staff who get involved in their life but specifically what is your message uh, or why is your message important for students at Kelvin specifically what's your challenge to them so thinking about that generation once again as being uh, trained and learning and growing not only in their faith but also in these spheres of influence and of culture I guess I would say first, um, you've you've got something a lot of people your age don't have, which is a moral tradition, a spiritual tradition, an existential security that is lacking for a lot of young people. Second, entering a church that's you're going to change. There is a vast generation gap in the church these days, and in my view, the younger people are going to change it vastly for the better. Uh, I think on racial matters, on all sorts of matters, the rising generation, on um, liturgical matters, I think the, the rising generation is an exciting generation to be around. The final thing I'll say is that over the next 10 or 15 years of your life, you're going to make four commitments or recommitments. One, to your faith. Two, to a spouse and family. Three, to a career or vocation and four to a community. And the success of your life will depend on how well you choose and execute on those commitments. And my favorite definition of a commitment is falling in love with something and then building a structure of behavior around it for those moments when love falters. Jews love their God, but they keep kosher just in case. Uh, and so it's, I, I would think about that commitment, those those commitments, and how to think about how to choose and execute upon those commitments, and if you can do that well, life will well life will be sweet.
Thank you, David, for that call to be for witness, for testimony, and certainly for a call again to courage, love, and joy. I want to thank you again tonight on behalf of the organizing committee for the Kuiper Conference and Prize. And once again, we look forward to when that conference will take place. But we are honored once again for you to be the recipient for the 2020 Kuiper Prize Award. And I know as we look at those who are in chats, I can and I hope you've been able maybe to see some of those even from your view stance that there's just great appreciation for you and for I will call it a ministry that you have and ask you though once again to be encouraged by tonight and we look forward to how, when our paths do cross again for your ministry and ours to coincide and uh, help each other along the way. So blessings well, to you and blessings to everybody tonight. Thank you. It's a great honor to be anywhere associated with Kuiper, with Calvin, and especially with the previous winners. It's a, I'm humble. Thank you again. Good evening.